our holiday was finished and then they came from the mayor's office that we have to go to our synagogue and we have to pack something not too much with us, whatever we could carry. And one night we stayed in our synagogue and the next morning all the families got a carriage and we went to another town that was real near the railroad station and from there we went to the ghetto. I don't know if you ever heard what a ghetto is. We were all uh, put in like, we were in an apartment, that one bedroom apartment, four families, you know, we slept on the floor. And then they were making the ghetto smaller and smaller. They were taking away a lot of people. And the last place we were sleeping up in an attic and it was very bad because it was near near the uh, train station and all night you hear the, the train whistling. And we were there for about three weeks, I, I'm not sure quite. And then they told us to get whatever we had with us back up and we met in the courtyard in the synagogue. And from there we walked to the railroad station. We were put in cattle cars, there was no seat and, and a lot of people we could hardly move that's how many people in one, one cattle car, and the door was closed. They give you to use for a bathroom, a box bucket, which was very embarrassing, you know. Some of us, we didn't even want to relieve ourselves. I don't know how long it took until finally we got to Port Auschwitz, but the other, you know, a little bit further from there, we called Beer Canal, that's what they took us. And it was still dark in the morning when we arrived, the door opened and they were calling, there were these men with striped uniforms and they were calling, telling the men should go separate from the women. So we didn't even have a chance to say goodbye to my father and my brother. I have a younger brother and an older sister. And my mother and my sister were walking and one of the couples asked my mother how old she was. He spoke German, my mother spoke very good German. That was the second language in Hungary, German. And she was only 42, I don't know why, she said 52. And then she said that they were separating her. They were left, sending her to the left side and my sister and I went to the right side. And people were asking all kinds of questions. So they said, oh, you see them later. As, the, as, it, as it was trying to be lighter already, we saw all these wooden barracks, you know, a lot of barracks. As we, we got to the, this big building, they told us to go in there and take off our clothes and just hold our shoes. And to take off our clothes, there were men walking around and stand one, of the, one line, you know, everybody. And when you looked ahead, they saw, you saw men cutting off your hair and you had to be naked. It was very shocking and embarrassing. And everybody probably thought, oh, maybe they wouldn't cut my hair, maybe somebody's hair will be clean or something, but they, they shaved all our hair. And whenever you had hair, the men, then we went out to another building, and in front of the building there was a little cement container with this white liquid. And they said to put your shoe in there, in that container, that was like to disinfect. And we went into this big room and there was shards of water coming down. And it, it was, you, you just don't understand what, what's going on, you know, you were so confused. And then you didn't recognize each other. You know, sisters, without the hair, it was very hard to recognize each other. Everybody was shouting their sister, relative's name. And then we got through with the shower, we went out and they had all kind of snow under there, just some kind of a dress. They give you something to put on in our shoes. And they took us to, to, to uh, these barracks. We were from wood beds, three layers. And we had to 12, six on each side. You couldn't lay down on your bed. There was no, not enough room, you know, to lay down on your bed. And three times a day they were counting us. We were standing outside. In the morning it was very cold, especially when you don't have hair, you know. They had a, a place where you washed just your hands and your face, there was no towels or paper, and the bathroom also, there is no paper or anything. We had the bathroom, a long room with holes, and then, and three times a day they were counting us. If there was one missing, 
we have to stand there outside until they find sometimes they don't feel good or you know they stayed in the bathroom we had to stay until everybody was accounted for and then they gave us something in the morning uh, i don't even know what it was liquid in the beginning when you went hungry you really couldn't even eat anything and and also lunch time one one dish and you had to drink it there was no spoon or, or anything like that and in the beginning the air had such a terrible smell like it was burning flesh smell and you felt so nauseous you couldn't believe it but when you got very hungry a couple of days later already you couldn't worry about that <coughs> you were hungry and also at night they gave us something to eat a piece of black bread you know like i said in the, in the beginning we didn't want to have it we eat it but then we were hungry so we ate it so there were always So we were separated and I was running after her. There was like a, look like a foam boot, you know, when you go, go in a, a boarding boot, you know, when you go boarding and they were pushing in girls there and I was going after her and this girl, her name was Miri. She called a block artist. She was watching us and she said, you don't go with her. I said, but my sister, I want to go with her. She said, no. She said, she's going to be taken to a place where there's going to be more food and she's going to be better. I thought I was trying to believe it. I didn't know if I wanted to believe it or not. I had, we, we were five of us from the same town. And with my sister, we talked about it. We still be separated, I tried to be with the friends. And we were outside in a group. They were standing there. I could have gone with them. I don't know. I couldn't understand why I didn't go with them. Later, I find out that they really had a tough time and I don't think I would have ever made it. So some things are meant to be, you know, you can can question it because I was taken to a factory with a lot of other girls and we were given a coat also. And by then they took away my shoes, they gave me a wooden shoes and they were a little bit better. They, they had a little mattress on the bed, no cover. So I used my coat for the cover. And every morning we got up very early and we had to go to the factory. This all the German men were, you know, in uniform watching us as we go to the factory. I was considered between the younger ones, so I didn't work on a heavy machine, but there was like this wooden tray with little black, there was like little, like a screw inside. You had to examine it, shouldn't have any imperfection, you know, that was good and you put it back and standing all day like that. I can't remember if they gave us lunch. I really can't remember. At night, they took us back to our place and you know, you're so hungry, you, you were waiting for Sunday because Sunday they gave you potato and a little bit better food. So you were waiting for that one Sunday to, and there we were, there, there, there were girls, they were political prisoners, you know? They had their own nice clothes. They used to get packages from home. And we really couldn't talk to them too much. They were more, most like from Czechoslovakia and Poland, you know? And, but they had some food that they got from home. And sometimes they gave us a little bit of a cookie or something. And there was the washroom we used, that's where we met. And what happened is I had all these scabs on my leg, on my arm. And infirmary said, it's vitamins deficiency, you know? And they gave me something to put on, but I was so embarrassed, so I went to the washroom very late when I know nobody's gonna be there anymore because I was so embarrassed. And one day, the, the, this Miri was with us, said to us, well, you have to mark the coat, you know, which factory you go, and please do it, you know? And I know it was the last day, and I was very late, and I thought, oh, she's gonna be angry at me, scream at me, and, I always remembered my mom telling me, if you behave and you you 
will be, be a young lady, nobody will ever harm you. So I went to her, I said, Mary, I just bought my coat to find, but please don't be angry because I told her I went to the washroom because I'm embarrassed what happened and she didn't say anything, she left. So we worked there for a long time. We heard a lot of bombing and, you know, the, the, or God, they were, had a shelter, but we didn't go any, anywhere dancing. We heard bombing, you know, all these noises. And uh, I remember, we never know the time, I mean, the, what date or month or, but one day somebody said, November 17, I said, my God, that's my birthday. I became 18 that November 17. And so we worked there for until April. And I know the war, you know, we had this old lady working with us, a German old lady. She was very kind. At Christmas time, she bought us a little bit of apple. You know, it made you feel good because you could see the apple humans, you know, and there was a beautiful blonde young lady and she would tell us, you know, the war is going to be over soon, don't worry, you're going to be all right. They weren't really allowed to talk to us, but they were very nice. I like to remember people that under those circumstances, the people are nice, you know, no matter what the situation is, if you're nice to people, make them feel good, you know, and that was important. And we worked there until April, and then I guess the war, one side the Russians came and one side the, the English, first the Eng English came. And so they were, we were taken away from the factory and we were walking, marching all night, you know, and there was such a chaos. We saw people, you know, German people, they had this handheld car, they were, everybody was running, you know, and the, the, the electric poles were burning. It was really such a chaos, you know, we were walking. And this was April the, the 12th, because we, we were liberated April the 13th. And then we got to this town, they told us, all the guards that were watching us, a couple of women, it was interesting because the German women were putting on this white kerchief on their head, and then old men have little white flags. We didn't know what was that, that meant if, if they come, they, they, you must you surrender, you know, I guess that's what it meant. And so they said to us, go up in the hills and lay down because we heard a lot of shooting, you know. And that's where we were at night, laying down on the hill. And then we saw this German soldier with a machine gun. And we thought he was going to kill us, but I guess he was just running away, you know. He must have left his troop and run away somewhere. And in the morning, we got up and there was a little house in the bottom of the hill. And we went into this little house. There was a strange scene. We see this one of these is Polish ladies that also for the block artist, sitting on a bed, held on a, a robe, a silk robe, and holding an open umbrella. It was a strange sign, but I guess for I don't know how many years she didn't see an umbrella or you know, dressed nice. And then we saw jeeps going by, you know and they stopped and they were questioned. I mean, they had no idea who we are. And we saw all these boxes on the jeep. We thought they were gonna give us something to eat, but they, they just left, they didn't want to eat. And by then we saw a lot of men, they worked in a different factory. I'd never seen them before, also in the same time. And we saw a car going with milk on the, they were carrying milk. They stopped it and they took off the, can of milk and we were trying to give us a little bit of milk. And then, you know, it was, nothing was organized. We were just walking around, you know, and I always remember it was still in my mind how it surprised me. We were walking around, we were five of us, and this lady from a house begging for us to come in. It surprised me that she wasn't afraid of us. She, I don't know if she knew who we were. Or, and she said to us, go to the bathroom, wash up, and I haven't got too much food, but whatever I, I have, I give you some. And we stayed there one night, you know. Oh, she wasn't afraid from us. So, but you have to see there are good people, even in the midst of the war, there are still people that care about each other, you know. 
So we stayed there that one night, but we thanked her. We didn't want to impose on her anymore, and we were full of lies. We wouldn't believe in, in the clothes that we had in the sea, and were itching from it, you know, were biting us all over. They left. But then the English liberated us, but they weren't very nice people. I don't know why. But then the Americans came up, came in. They had this empty, like an office building, and they set up some cots for us, and they had a kitchen downstairs, and they started to cook for us. But there was no water, you know. The, the, I don't know why the pipe was bombed. And there was a, we walked around, and I see this store, and I see this bottle that says acid. In Hungarian, acid means vinegar. And I was so thirsty, I took that little bottle, I opened it up and I put it a drop on my tongue. And I I had a bent down and drop in with my saliva and, and drink till I was all red and burning. And I asked my friend to see anything and I looked in the one of the windows and I saw all this red which was acid. Very, very strong. For days I couldn't eat anything. I could just drink whatever liquid they gave me. And so we were there, I don't know how long. And they took us to a, a, a train station. You would want to know, first they came, these Red Cross people came and they asked us, I was between the youngest one, to go with them. And they explained to us, well, if you want to go to one of the Scandinavian countries, families would adopt you and we would have a, you would have a very good life. We didn't care about what could what good life. We wanted to go home to see if anybody still alive to go home to our, our country. So we didn't want to go with, with anybody. We didn't want any interest in going anywhere. And the trains were very hard to get a train, a passenger train. The Russian, wherever the Russian came in, they took everything. You see trains going day and night with toilets in their sink there, all kind of things. They were shipping everything to Russia. But finally, when we had a passenger train, we got on, and some of the stations, people came to the station and had food sandwiches they gave us. And, and then this, one, one time we stopped here, and there was a very famous place called Kalsbad. It was a resort place. And they took us up, up in the hills, beautiful, clean, like a sanatorium, and for the first time, we slept in a clean bed. And they wanted us to stay there only one night. We, we, we just wanted to go home. We wanted to see, you know, if anybody survived. So we tried to catch another train. And finally, we got to the border of Hungary, you know. And there were people waiting because they know people were coming back and people were waiting for us to tell us. And they were telling us to, there is a place, you know, this building and told us there, that's where it is, and we could go there and we tell you who you are, you know. But it was, we went on the on the streetcar, you know, and the conductor asked for money. So a couple of girls had big mud and they let them have it. You asked for money, we haven't got nothing. After what we went through, you asked for money, and some people were very surprised that, you know, they were so nasty. Anyway, I went to this building and they asked me where I'm from and I said, you know what? I had a, my mother's older sister lived in, in Budapest and they still home, they're back in their home and they said, you have two cousins also, two boy cousins, two young men, they're all there and in the morning, they said, stay here one night and in the morning you could go you know, and I know where, where it was. So early in the morning I got dressed and I went and I rang the bell and my aunt opened the door and she looked at me, she said, well, you look familiar, but I don't know who you are. And I said, Aunt Miriam, Martha. She said, oh my God, that I was probably half of the side that she remembered me. I was never skinny, so she couldn't recognize me. And I came in and well, I didn't want to talk about things because it was very hard, you know. So we cried a little bit and I stayed there, you know, 
but the Russians were in the country and it was very scary because one of my cousins, Benar, she, he was dressed up, in, it was in the winter and he was dressed up in a warm coat and boots and one Russian stopped him and took off his coat and he came home in his underwear. So we never had a night at night. It was very scary, you know, to stay in there. So I really didn't want to stay. I didn't even want to stay in the country. And my aunt, they all survived, my uncle and two cousins. One, one was my age and one is a little bit younger and you know that they're still alive. I have to tell you, one lives in Israel and one lives in Borough Park. And this cousin, younger than I am, she has 34 grandchildren and 54 great grandchildren. They're very religious. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And not long ago, when I had my birthday in November, my children wanted to do something special for me. So they sent the car service for her, and I had another second cousin, and they came one afternoon and we spent the time together. Anyway, I, I wanted to leave Hungary, and wherever I had to. First, my aunt took me back home where I came from, you know. and. I didn't find anything and I didn't want to stay there, but they had some, you know, somebody, one of the young men, a Jewish young man came home, the Russians liberated him and he became the mayor of the town and he said to me, there's a room there and wherever we find in your house is there, but only two, two silver candle holders that he gave me that. So the, before I left Budapest, I had that in my knapsack and wherever I had, you know, clothes. And we were on the train, but before we went to the American zone, this was the Russian zone, Hungary, and before we went over to the American zone, the Russians came up on the train and when they looked in my knapsack, they saw the seat where they took everything away from me. So I left, whatever I was wearing, that's how I left. And we went to Vienna. There was, they were set up special places where we stayed, you know. And that too, they inspected us. You know, you ever see the, the, the box spray when they spray against us? That's what they use for us too. Very, very embarrassing, you know. And anyway, when I came up there from Hungary, I came with some children. You know, I, interesting, I felt so sorry for myself until I met these little children. Because I was 18 and I had wonderful memories of my family. But these little children didn't even, even remember their parents. They were saved in an orphanage. And so so I was with them, and another lady had a little daughter, so the two of us were watching. I forgot already how many, maybe five or six little children, about five or six years old, you know. And they, they all, they cried at night sometimes. They all just, just give them a hug and, and they just wanted a little bit of love, you know. So we went to Germany. I was in a DP camp called Leipheim, you know. And it's interesting. One one day, the children put on, put on a show. There was a stage and the children put on a show. And we were all watching the children. And this girl turned around in front of me. And I said, oh my God. I said, Hannah, this is what the... the we were in Auschwitz together, and we, we were liberated together, and we said goodbye to each other, and I stayed in Budapest, and they went back to their hometown. And so she said, we all here, and we went to look for you to your, your aunt's house, and they told me that you're in Germany someplace, maybe we'll find you. And so we were very happy to see each other. And, you know, I, I love those children, but they were not group, was not religious. And I came from a religious family. My grandfather was a, rab was a rabbi and my, all my uncles from my mother's side. And so they persuaded me to leave these children and go with them. So I left and I stayed with them. And then there was a, you know, you couldn't go anywhere, you know, you had to wait. I got papers from this country for my relatives, but I, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. So one of the sisters, there were five sisters, one passed away after liberation, and this younger sister, Esther, her name was Esther, the two of us 
went to Canada. Family sponsored you and so we went to Canada and stayed with this family. They had two little boys and so we had to have, you know, with the two little boys. And then my uncle, I had an uncle with my, my mother's sister and her husband was a, was a rabbi and in 1940 they came to this country and so my uncle wrote a letter to this family that I stayed with to please let me come here. And they were telling me, you're not gonna like America. Canada is much nicer. You have a better life in Canada. Canada was more like a, a European life than of course the two of But I said, but these are my families, you know? And so I came, I came to this country and I stayed with my aunt. I had here one end that was my mother's sister, but I had two other ends from my father's side. I don't know how much time we have. I have to tell you that my father was in this country in 1910. He was a young man. He went to medical school in this country. And when he find out that he's, he had two sisters, he and a brother. And he find out that his, his mother was six, he went to home for a visit. And World War One broke out and he couldn't come back. And he was a medic in the army and he was captured, he was a prisoner in Russia. So he used to tell us about this country. I love this country. He used to tell us about the beach and the South Bay. And then he told us about Russia, how cold it was in Siberia. He said, you know, the prisoners used to freeze. There was no medication for sick people and they used to freeze to death. But then, after the war, they were prisoner exchange, so that's how he came back, you know. And what else? Anyway, I met my husband. My aunt said one day, we're gonna visit my niece. And my cousins looked at her very strange. She said, Martha just came here, where are you taking her? So that's okay. So I went to, with my aunt to visit his niece, her husband, and there was this young man, her husband, the brother and they introduced me. And, you know, they talked a little bit. And so he asked me, his name was Sidney, he asked me for my telephone number and I said to him, I said, you know, I think my, your sister-in-law has my aunt's telephone number. And, and we went, left and my aunt said to me, you know, it was very rude what you said to him. <laughs> he asked for your telephone number. I said, but I just came in here and I'm not interested really to go, go out or anything. But anyway, before he called me up, he made sure that I'm gonna go out with him. So he called me to ask me for a date. And that's how it happened, and, and I married him <laughs> anyway. He persuaded me because when he talked about his family, he was lucky enough to come here. First his father came, then his two older brothers, and then he came before the war, you know? And his mother and a sister, and one sister, was married, he didn't come, he lost the child, but she survived with her husband. And so we were married in 1950, December the 3rd. And we've been married for 65 years. And my husband is now 94, and we live in this assistant living Jewish home. And he has Alzheimer's and he has heart problem, but I'm trying to take care of him. I call him baby and he's my baby now. I'm still lucky to have him, right? You all have grandparents, right? They must be in their 60s only, right? Right. Well, I have three grandchildren, but the, the youngest is 28. And the oldest is 40. You know, and, and one just got married not long ago, 31. Very nice young lady. He's Jewish, but she's not Jewish, but she's a sweet girl, and they're very happy. And I'm not, looking at any religion. I just like people the way they are. I'm not going to discriminate against anybody. I don't think it's the right thing to do, you know? And my granddaughter, her name is Stara Sen. That's her stage name. If you look it up in, on your telephone or computer, you know what she does? She did some acting in New York or Broadway, and she does commercial, but she does the book taping, you know? Instead of reading the book, you listen to it, so that's what she does. If you if you look her up, tell 
punch your name in and you're gonna find that pair of stairs. She lives in California. Once she goes to California, she does not want to come back to the snow. <laughs> anyway, and my son is a psychiatrist. He also lives in California. He has a lot of famous uh, patients. And one daughter lives in Cherry Hill. She's an audiologist, so I have hearing aid. I don't really need it that much, but she gave me hearing aid. And one daughter lives in Hillsdale. She works for an eye doctor. Okay, Any, anything you want to ask me? You can ask questions. Just raise your hand. Yes. Did you ever see Adolf Hitler? The what? Have you, did you ever end up seeing Adolf Hitler? Did you ever see Hitler? Hitler? No. Just speak up, guys, okay? Hitler was a card. He killed Hitler himself. Didn't want to face. He ruined his own people, too, you know? Their people are suffering, you know? Don't think that everybody was going with him, everybody agreed with him. You know, the people suffered, everybody suffered. Young people died, there is a war, young people died, you know. It wasn't fair, and, and what can you do? That's where we pray to God that things like that never should happen again, yes. What camp did you go to? What camp? Yeah. You mean Auschwitz? Oh. They called Birkenau, Auschwitz Birkenau. And, and the DP camp, that's called displaced persons camp. There was a lot in Germany, you know. Was lifetime that was I before I, I left Germany. Yes. Yes. Um. Was Auschwitz? Uh, was Auschwitz? Was the only camp you went to? Yes, that was the only camp because from there they took me to work in a factory. So I didn't go to any other camp. Yes. You said your birthday was November seventeenth. Right? Seventeenth. Mine's November sixteenth. Okay, the good people, right? <laughs> How old are you? I was 89. Oh, you're 89, okay. Old, well, right? <laughs> when, you, when you're this young, 30 years old, right? <laughs> I remember. Yes. Teresa, okay. But today, well, I don't think like an old person. I kid around, I said, I can't stand old people. They always <laughs> complain about something. <laughs> I love young people. And, and I had so much fun with my grandchildren. We spend so much time together, you know, and I learned from them. I remember my granddaughter, she was very active, always doing things that you have to worry about when you babysit, you know, not to get hurt. So when she didn't feel good, she was very quiet. So I said, Paul, oh, so nice, you're so good today. It would be nice if you be like all the time. I said, Grandma, it's very hard to be good all the time. <laughs> And that's, and I used to tell joke to my grandsons. The older one would listen, and the younger one would say, Grandma, you already told us the joke. <laughs> but they love my food. I made their favorite food. And one of my grandsons, the younger one, he loves to cook and bake. Ooh, he loves to cook and bake. He's nice and heavy. <laughs> yes. That is good, you know. And this time of the year is the, the nicest time. So enjoy your life. And love your grandparents. Right? You could get away with a lot with your grandparents, all right? But you have to listen to your parents, you know, because they really want the best for you. We don't believe it when you're young, right? You listen to your friend more. <laughs> but believe me, they, they want the best for you. And today's, yes. My, my sister, they guessed them. They guessed all the people who put in the crematorium. It's very sad. I could tell you this much. If I wouldn't live that too, I would never believe that such cruelty and evil could happen. And people that you talk about the ISIS now, I'm sure you hear them on television, they are really mostly low class hoodlums, but these were educated people. And this was, was the most shocking thing to they should do this to, to people for how many years? You know? Yes. How old were you when you got to New York? How old I was? When I got to New York. When you came here? When I came here? Yes. Oh boy, how old I was? Well, I was married when I was 24. I, I came a year before, so I was 23. You could understand my accent? Yes. 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 Because we don't lose it. The Hungarians have the heavy accent, right? <laughs> but he speaks Hungarian. Can you imagine that? My children don't, a couple of words, but not really. Uh, I didn't speak Jewish, you know. The boys went to 
your sleeve a cord, you know what they do with boys. But they you learn how to speak Jewish, but I never learned. And the second language was German, so my grandmother spoke better German than Hungarian. He came from a place that used to be Czechoslovakia, you know? And uh, so she spoke very good German and, and broken Hungarian. <coughs> and she was an old lady. I even have a picture. Would you want to see the picture? Yeah. I have one picture that I wanted to. <laughs> it was probably taken in 1934. This is me. Thank you. 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 Th